The difference between really successful people and people who chase success is how they deal when it dips. How you deal with that sets the tone and the narrative of your life because it's inevitable that it's going to happen. But if you know that, there are so many ways that you can immediately control the narrative as opposed to being controlled by it that you start winning. So I run a digital platform called Humans of Bombay. We're India's largest storytelling platform. Even if you impact one person, one child, it's a life. Please go ahead and do it. As women, I feel like we have such a big issue with asking for what we deserve. And we absolutely and vehemently and relentlessly ask. And that's in your personal and your professional life. You have that little voice that's annoying that says that you can't. Learning how to shut that voice up and attune to things that you want is a game changer. You're going to be criticized and you're going to be asked questions and you're going to have people not agree with you. And that's a part of accepting that mm -hmm. you belong in the public eye. And that's so true. as simple as that. You cannot, you can't please everybody. So then just do what you have to do anyway. Krishma, <laughs> welcome to Mumbai's Millennial Mind. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be doing this. I'm so happy to have you here. Since <laughs> I started my podcast, season two, I messaged you <laughs> and I've been following Humans of Bombay for so long and I'm just so in awe of everything you've done. So this podcast is selfish actually because I'm here to learn so much from you. <laughs> I really think I'm going to be disappointing you. <laughs> no, not at all. But for people who don't know who you are, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, wow, it's a loaded a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I run a digital platform called Humans of Bombay. Uh, we're India's largest storytelling platform. Uh, and uh, storytelling is the essence of everything that we do. Um, and now we just want to um, bring these kind of stories and storytelling to the world in as many formats as possible. Uh, we have an amazing team of 40 people who work mm -hmm. on this vision every single day and I'm very grateful uh, and I've been receiving a lot of love for Humans of Bombay so um, just happy, happy girl. <laughs> it is honestly just a wonderful platform and I heard about it years ago. Thank you. But I really want to know, you know, how did you think of the idea? How did you bring that into fruition? Like, did you, what did you do after school? Um, after college? Yeah. Uh, this is the first thing I actually did. Really? Yeah, I was I was fresh out of college. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to start something called NOC. Uh, so it's KNOQ, uh, where I wanted to have like uh, closed room um, discussions or interactions with industry leaders. Uh, okay. Even back then, I think community for me was very important. Um, I actually did try that. I held one workshop. Okay. Uh, it was this place in uh, on Pedder Road. It was called Ave 29. And I sold out as a 21 year old. I sold out like 50 tickets to talk about wow. like manifestation and like the secret effectively. Because yes. um, I'm, I'm a practicer or I'm a believer of um, the law of attraction as the base, yes, but the concept of spirituality in a much larger level because in over 10 years I've kind of grown and evolved. Uh, but I did sell that out. Um, I then wanted to start a magazine on the lines of Thought Catalog, which mm -hmm. is like really beautiful words. Uh, I have a thing for writing, I have a thing for words and emotions and emoting via words. Um, and Humans of Bombay was supposed to be a column in that magazine. Right. Like just one column. that would go into this weekly editorial, I had that in my mind. Um, but I think the, the magazine never happened because Humans of Bombay just took off. And wow. um, yeah, it happened just like that. I took a six month sabbatical after college because I, I have an industrial economics degree. Oh my gosh. Um, and then this is what I did. And how did it kind of take off? Because you know, if, if I told someone I want to share you know, stories and I want to talk around people's experiences and I'm going to make a massive business out of this and this is going to be India's largest platform and globally recognized. People 10 years ago would be like, what are you talking about? Because yeah. social media wasn't as, mm. I know it was on the rise, mm. but now it seems a little bit more manageable and achievable. Yeah. But back then it probably seemed like just an idea, right? Yeah. Uh, so I didn't have a business plan or a structure. I just, listen, I knew that I had a degree and mm -hmm. I had 
I had time on my side. So mm-hmm. I figured that I'm just going to do this until I figure it out, right? Like, and right. I fell in love with this. And then I knew that, okay, I need to make just this work. Um, how did it blow up? So um, I'm very tenacious as a personality. Mm-hmm. I don't... I don't hear the word no very often. I just think of it as, okay, it's a challenge and I need to figure a way around this no. Um, <laughs> it's not a good thing in some, time, like in some places because then I'm just like obsessive about certain things. But um, I would, I remember we launched Humans of Bombay on Jan 28th, 2014. Okay. And we got like a thousand likes uh, on Facebook, which was pretty big yeah. back then in the same day. Uh, in the same week, we had about 10,000, and in the month, we had about 20,000. So then, like, newspapers started organically picking it up and being like, there's something going on here. Um, but I would take, I've taken at least 20 to 30 people in my inner circle, like friends and family, and invited everybody on their list to like this page. <laughs> and I did that behind the scenes. I just did it because I just wanted more people to know about it or more yes. people to join uh, the community that I w- wanted to build. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think it just took off, honestly. Uh, and I just loved what I was doing. And back in the day, I was a, uh, I learned a new word. Uh, my COO taught it to me recently. It's called OMA, which okay. is one man army, which means that you shoot, you write, you interview all by yourself. So she said you were an OMA. Yes, so I was an Oma for about like a year and a half. That's I'm an Oma right now. Yeah, you're an that's Oma. how I feel. You're an Oma, yeah. So you learn th- that's something new that you can use, you can say I'm an Oma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult though because in in this moment where I'm at, and I'm sure you're at, when you're doing everything, to then relinquish control and yeah. let people kind of go forward and yeah. grow the business is really tough. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier that spirituality has been a huge part of your journey and it's yeah. taken you 10 years to kind of discover it, grow through it and yeah. understand it. Tell me, you know, when you first started to, to kind of connect with that side of yourself. I think 18, 19 is when I read The Secret and I kind of understood it. Um, but I really got into meditation around 25, 26 and then okay. really aggressive, uh, the aggressive need to be aligned internally last mm. two, three years. Uh, I, I, I speak very often at uh, youth led events or conferences. Mm-hmm. And the only thing, the one thing that I never fail to say is that, please meditate, please look inwards. I wish somebody had been aggressive to tell me that when mm-hmm. I just begun, I think I would be leap years ahead. Um, it's changed my life. It's changed how I look at myself. It's changed how I look at the world. Um, I, I feel very limitless and very powerful, even on days that things aren't going my way. And I think that's where the magic is. That wow. You know, the people usually ask, like, what's your secret sauce? And I said that, look, if you look at it, if you take a step back and look at it holistically, look at your mm-hmm. life, either past, present or future, the narrative is always going to be up and down. It, it's going to be like this, which means that you're alive. So if you look at it uh, on a macro level, you take a bird's eye view of your present, your past or your future, it's all the same. It's always going to be up and down. Mm-hmm. It's never going to plateau. Uh, and that's a sign that you're alive. Mm-hmm. Um, And I think that the difference between really successful people and people who chase success is how they deal when it dips. Yes. When when things go to the roof, through the roof, or when things really plummet, which they they tend to spiral. Like so many people would say, right? Like one thing led to another and another, and it was just such a bad day after bad day. How you deal with that? sets the tone and the narrative of your life because it's inevitable that it's going to happen. But if you know that, there are so many ways that you can immediately control the narrative as opposed to being controlled by it that um, you start winning. Mm. And when you make a habit of winning in the little things, the flowers that you give to yourself or the music playlist that you have on standby knowing that this is going to lift your energy up or the phone call that makes you smile when Mm. these things are happening is how you win at life. And I think that really successful people do this the best 
they know how to deal with the plummets. Everyone defines success in different ways. How do you define success? Uh, I think that that meaning has evolved for me over time. Uh, I don't think it's quantifiable anymore. I did okay. think that it would be that uh, uh, I would be at a certain place in my life, either in my personal life or professional life. But I just realized that that's a that's that's a number that you're chasing, right? Like mm. by this age, I'll have this yes. or I'll have that. Uh, I look at it a lot more qualitatively now. Um, success to me would be living well, living abundantly, um, living in love, mm. uh, all kinds of love. Uh, I think that we look at love very unilaterally. Um, love is everywhere and I like living in that feeling. Um, uh, I like living in abundance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I do believe that there are certain goals which I can calculate via metrics, which I do have, but mm -hmm. that doesn't dis dis define my success. Yeah. The state of mind that I'm in, I think I'm at the peak of my success right now because that's the mind space I'm in right now, even though I may not have met my goals, if it's that so makes true. sense. Yeah. No, it's so true. Last year I, I was in my corporate job mm. and every time I'm tired or I'm drained or I think, oh my gosh, this is so difficult. I always think back to this is what you dreamt of mm. and in an instant I feel happy like in an instant I landed here at 10 o'clock and I hadn't set up anything and then the next I just came from a wedding and the next day I had three guests yeah. from 8 a.m. Yeah. and I was so tired yeah. and I remember sitting here thinking you dreamt of yeah. this moment yeah. and I think we are so focused on the goal yeah. and so less focused on where we are at the moment yeah. and how yeah. far we've come yeah. and that always helps me like in an instant change my mindset of thinking I'm yeah. so lucky to be here this is yeah. my job yeah. and you it's, know? Your, it's, it's your it's my dream, dream. Yeah. like you get to live I get to live my dream every single day and yeah. I don't take it for granted do I crib about it sometimes yeah I really don't want to work um, yes. yes but then do I bring myself back and be like dude this is not worth even a second of energy being negative so true. on this topic yeah you're so successful as a woman and so young already <laughs> but have you ever felt you've had to compromise anything and being a woman in business or any taboos or stereotypes or challenges that have been thrown your way I've always said this it's been um, it's never been a deterrent for me and I say this because I don't think there's any point dramatizing a non-issue. It's, it's not been an issue for me. And I'm not saying that it isn't an issue for women everywhere. But me in particular, it hasn't been a problem, which I think is good. Which I, I think agree. that, yeah. Uh, the only question I do ask is, I've gotten a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. the, the table that uh, that is considered coveted. But why aren't there more women on yes. that table? is the yes. only question I have, which is why um, uh, I think there's a hashtag associated with me because I use it that often, it's with women in business. Um, to let women, girls everywhere know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't come from, I built this business from scratch. I took a one lakh rupee loan from my father, which I have repaid with interest. Um, did I exercise privilege in the in the perspective that I was given the opportunity to explore this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I have somebody when I was not making money for the first three years support me? Yes. I, I'm very privileged and very grateful that my parents allowed me that. Outside of that, everything that I have built, um, we have built as a company, um, it's it's hard work, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of it's it's a lot of growth, and it's a lot of learning. Like year on year, to pushing the envelope, to making yes. storytelling storytelling more accessible, easier, simpler, more relatable, um, and having a team that rallies around that notion. Uh, I think that um, that has nothing to do with anything except a vision. It's so easy when someone's successful to, to figure out why, right? Like, oh, you are only successful because of this. Yeah. And you can blame different circumstances or you can attribute people's success to money or fame yeah. or followers. But I think 
what people don't understand is we all, and I say this all the time, we all come from a place of privilege. Yeah. Someone somewhere comes from a place of privilege. Yeah. Whether someone gave you a thousand pound loan or a one pound loan or just, you know, I live at home with my parents mm -hmm. and that's why I'm able to do this. So yes. I come from a place of privilege. Yeah. But even people who have been given money or have come from a background where their parents can give them unlimited resources, isn't it amazing they're doing something with it? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And it's so easy for us to judge them and think, well, your parents handed you this business. Okay, but I grew it five times. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so powerful is, you know, I love it when people openly say it. Look, this is what I came from and I did something with it. Yeah. Because if you didn't do something with it, yeah. then people are going to criticize you too. It's either or, right? Like, right. Uh, there's no way you can shut out critique. And that's something I've learned uh, over the years that, uh, um, you're going to be criticized and you're going to be asked questions and you're going to uh, have people not agree with you and that's a part of accepting that mm -hmm. you belong in the public eye and that's so true. as simple as that you cannot you can't please everybody so then just do what you have to do anyway did your parents support you from the beginning no they were concerned um, mm -hmm. 21 year old girl going out with a camera asking people <laughs> on the street <laughs> what do you do um, they didn't get it and I don't blame them I, like a lot of people didn't get it it was only like a couple of weeks in that I finally saw that this has value yes it's it's adding value to people's lives and um, I know the feeling that it's giving me when I'm able to to strike that code so I'm going to keep doing it. And I'm very, I'm stubborn as a person. So if, the, if there's an idea that germinates in my mind, I have to see it through. And that, that happens at work all the time. And a lot of times I'm advised not to do it because it doesn't make logistical sense or it's too far-fetched or the team is stretched too thin. Mm -hmm. And I finally learned how to accept those opinions and implement it. So I've, I've started showcasing restraint. And wow. I think that um, when you have passion, you have enthusiasm, uh, restraint goes a long way. It actually balances out the madness with method. So um, I think that's also a part of my growth trajectory over the past couple of years. And as a leader of managing so many different parts of this business that, you know, something that is your baby, you know, you've, you've founded it, you are the, mm -hmm. you're the vision behind it. How do you manage when you, we deal with that kind of conflicting opinion from people? Because there's probably a lot of people watching and listening and thinking, I've started this business, I've grown it now. Mm -hmm. People want to take it in different directions. This yeah. is not necessarily something I wanted to do, but yeah. I have to be open to new ideas because yeah. everyone has a different power play. Does yeah. that happen? Uh, I have very talented people on the team. Mm -hmm. So I know that my attention is spread so thin but there are people who are specialized in doing a particular role mm -hmm. and I need to I need to hand it to the experts. Um, it's tough, relinquishing control is something that I think all leaders have at some point in life had to deal with. It's mm -hmm. something to be dealt with because it yes. doesn't come naturally. Um, but you learn, you learn when, when there's enough on your plate, you're just like, okay, I'm not going to do this. I, I can't do this. Like, I used to be obsessive about our posting schedule, what is going to go up, <laughs> up on which day, and we have it months in advance, just yes. sorted. Um, I haven't looked at that in, I would say, a couple of months. Wow. And I can't believe it. I actually just can't believe it. Like, I don't know what's going up tomorrow. <laughs> and I, that would give me anxiety yeah. back in the day, but now it's fine. And how do you cope with those moments where you're feeling anxious or stressed? I know you've touched on meditation, but I'm sure as an entrepreneur, a lot of people will relate that you have days where you're flying and days where you're like, <laughs> what is going on? I can't do anything. I have a stress ball. Yeah. You have a stress ball? Yeah, all the time. Like it's, really? It actually relieves a lot of pressure. It's just that physical act. Uh, uh, but that's the truth. I actually do have a stress ball. But yeah, I, I like more spiritual and refined answer is that I do meditate mm -hmm. but in the moment I, I'm just like okay I need to control this uh, right now so um, it's an easy fix it's on my table and I just use it you just use it yeah one of the things I found really hard being here 
is that I see so many people on the street, like children, mothers, who are so much less fortunate, right? And when you're telling these stories and you're going around on the cam with this camera and telling all of these different stories about people's lives, is there ever a moment where you feel helpless or is there ever a moment where you find it hard to disconnect from the stories? Okay, so first thing is that I don't do very many stories on my own. I'm not an Oma anymore. Yes. <laughs> so we have an amazing content team uh, who work very hard to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, helpless, helplessness is a byproduct of understanding that you're providing a perspective that is so frustrating. Like when you mm -hmm. read about, when we tell stories about women who've been sexually abused, women who faced domestic violence, women who've, one woman who had a stomach open, cut open because the husband wanted to check the gender of the baby to make sure it was a boy. That has happened. Um, her name is uh, Anita Ji. Uh, she was from a little uh, village outside of uh, UP, I believe, and um, we read this in the news that she had five girls, and the sixth time when she got pregnant, and obviously she was reproducing again and again till she hit a boy. Got a boy, yeah. Um, and the sixth time he slid open her uh, stomach, and um, it was a boy who didn't survive, and she did. Um, and she was in the hospital. This man has been taken to jail, and. Uh, we decided to fundraise for her daughters. Uh, we raised 25 lakhs in wow. a couple of hours, saying that at least make sure that they're educated. Um, and you know, she called uh, our sub editor Kirti Shri and uh, said that, you know, send me a photo of you and your team. And Kirti Shri was like, sure, but why? And she said, uh, Oh my god. Because she's seen so, so much. <laughs> oh yeah, she seems so much. <laughs> Uh, sorrow in her life uh, because not because of anything else she was a happy girl just mm. as a byproduct of being a woman mm. and that's so frustrating but mm. then you're able to help and you're yes. able to do this yeah and um, I think that uh, we should do more you know to help yes I feel like this even if you are able to impact one person it's one life Mm -hmm. that you can change you know like a lot of times people think of impact at scale yes and I always say that impact even if you impact one person one child it's a life please go ahead and do it mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think that there is helplessness but then there's an antidote where yeah. you're able to actually do something and uh, you feel like uh, okay at least we helped that is so powerful, honestly. It just brought tears to my eyes immediately because I guess there's no greater feeling than trying to help someone and then actually being able to do it. Yeah. For someone you have no you have no connection with, right? You don't yeah. know them. And then yeah. to do that, that's so beautiful. Yeah. What's been one of your hardest days where you felt, gosh, this is this is really tough? I don't take very many personal days. Okay, unless I'm traveling, which I'm I always have my laptop so I'm connected. Mm -hmm. It's not unless I'm in I'm on a safari, which I enjoy <laughs> doing, or I'm diving, which also I enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, not allowing your personal life to bleed into the professional life, because your professional life is so demanding, mm -hmm. is sometimes a challenge. When you're having a really bad time in yeah. another aspect of your life, but you have to show up to work. I have mm -hmm. a commitment, I made a commitment, and I have to be there. So. When there are days that I feel low, which there are, um, I think it's difficult to show up at work, mm -hmm. but I do it and I have to do it. So, and how do you make that switch? Just a couple of things, you know, like I, I think like my body is now adjusted to that. Like my, my mind has to attune to the fact that, okay, you have to like go from here to here to here to here. What yeah. are you going to do about it? Right? Like, and then I try to get out of things and then I'm, I'm told, uh, you know, like my, my team obviously who's very well wishing is like, you know, we can't cancel at such mm. a last minute. It's not advisable to do it. Yes. Um, so then it's just a switch because I'm like, okay, I have to do this. Yeah. It's, it is what it is literally. And it's two, three hours of my time. I'm going to go and I'm going to live up to that commitment and then I'm going to come back home and then I'll wallow. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I've learned to compartmentalize a lot. I yeah. never used to be like that. But yeah. I think one of the things is with growing a social media platform, you have to learn to compartmentalize negative comments. Yeah. And because I've been able to do that, now I can compartmentalize so many things. Like if anything is going on in my personal life, yeah. I can really honestly shut down. Yeah. And just get on with my work. Yeah. I see that I see my personality as two different people. Right. Because you know, recently some stuff has been going on, and um, I said to my cousin, sometimes I feel not authentic, yeah. because people think my life is amazing, but they don't know I'm going through this yeah. hellhole at yeah. home. Yeah. And he said, well, if you were a teacher, and you went to school, would you stop crying your eyes out if you were a teacher who's mm. gone through a divorce? And mm. I was like, no, your your purpose is to teach the students. Yeah. And he said, exactly. So when you're doing these podcasts, your purpose is to make sure you're having really impactful conversations. Yeah. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you are in a good mind frame, right. like a good mindset. Yeah. So he was like, think of yourself as a teacher. Yeah. And ever since he told me that, that really shifted my my mindset yeah. into thinking, okay, you have to step into a role. Yeah. Even though it's yourself. Yeah. Have you found being authentic quite difficult on social media? I try to be as authentic as possible. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, there's a shoot that's going on and they want to depict a day in my life and they were like, okay, uh, do a little dance with the team. And I was like, absolutely not. That's not happening. I don't care how good it looks on camera. <laughs> it's just not happening. Uh, I say no more often than I used to before. Okay. I just say that this is not me. Because you set it. boundaries, I'm not doing it. Like it's oh, really? yeah, I'm I'm just not doing it. Or like um, I don't take up uh, external work. Like I, I moderate sessions and I give a lot of talks. And sometimes I feel like there's a pay parity, um, even at even at this stage of my career with my male counterparts. And I'm like, you gotta pay me for my time, or I'm gonna say no, and that's it. And I feel like as women we don't like to be overbearing because yes. we deal with all these labels like you know feminine and uh, it's dominating or whatever and i'm just like labels really belong in the closet and i have a lot of those in my closet i don't want to bring them into my life you can call me whatever but this is what it is and mm -hmm. i'm not going to be afraid of asking and if you can't then i can't and that's that's my boundary you're i'm you're paying me not for the one hour that I'm coming. You're paying me for the decade I took to build myself up to that one hour. Yes. As women, I feel like we have such a big issue with asking for what we deserve. And we absolutely and vehemently and relentlessly ask. And that's in your personal and your professional life. You're so right. I, I, I'm a big believer of that. And I yeah. feel like I've got every big interview by just being so persistent. Yeah. I always say it's it's very much around how you reframe the words. Yeah. So instead of saying I'm annoying, <laughs> I'm persistent. Yes. Instead of saying I'm arrogant, I'm confident. Yeah. And instead of saying, you know, I'm somebody who's agitating you and constantly pestering you, I'm someone who wants to, to grow. I'm someone who want, knows what I want. And I think as women, we very quickly fall into that narrative of labeling ourselves all the negative things. Yeah. And it's so easy to kind of go with what you've believed you always are. So someone said to me, you know, I'm really not confident. I can never ask a question. I don't know how to approach you. I was like, you've just done it now. You've yeah. just approached me. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a mindset thing of yeah. what, you, what you believe you are, you will become. Yes. So people always ask me, how did you become so confident? And I always say competence equals confidence. Yeah. So I always recommend talk in front of the camera. Yeah. You don't have to post it anywhere. Yeah. Just get your phone, pretend you're posting on Instagram, yeah. try it 20 times. Yeah. The 21st time, you're full confident and you want to post it on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. But with you, have you always been so confident? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's just the truth. Like I'm, yeah. I've always been, I've always been okay. Like having, I've just been very comfortable with standing up for what I want or how I want it, which is why at 21, when everybody else was getting jobs or uh, going in for a master's, I decided to come back home because I knew I wanted to start something. Mm. Um, and I think that I've um, kind of learned how to nurture that voice because I know now that it's operating from my gut and my gut very seldom is lying to me like it tells me something is just wrong yes. like you th this is wrong yeah. I, I know it's wrong 
and I can't, and people will think that it's a, how can you operate from your gut? It's actually scientifically proven. That, Tell me. Yeah, that it's a, it's an internal metric. Like you, you say it's, you're operating from the gut because it's actually true. There is, it, it actually means that there's that inner voice that already knows. And then a lot of people sometimes go with it, sometimes go without it. But um, I think there are two minds. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a subconscious and a conscious. Uh, learning to control the narrative and adding balance to uh, the synergy of the two um, is very important. So uh, I know when it's that true, that that authentic, from the gut straight up. This is this is just wrong, or this is not good. Uh, that I'm able to measure it and be like, okay, I'm not going to do it. And um, sometimes it's a false alarm, and then it's a spirituality, or the meditation, or the alignment that allows you to differentiate the former from the latter. Two of my mo videos that have gone viral. One, don't ask me when I'm getting married. Two, <laughs> energy doesn't lie. Yeah? Energy doesn't lie. Energy yeah. doesn't lie. And I s I'm exactly the same as you. I say, there have been times I've met people yeah. and they're amazing. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. But there's something that I'm like, th there is something, it's you know, it's not working it's and not. I can't work with them. Yeah. And people in the comment section, because obviously when videos do well, people are like, how can you say that? A lot like of people that. agreed, and a lot of people said, you know, I don't understand because surely when you're nervous around something or, you know, you are, you have pre-limiting beliefs, mm. you could say, well, it's my gut feeling that's telling me wrong. Yeah. You know, so how do you distinguish between something that you're nervous around mm. or let's say a clouded measure rather than knowing it's your gut? Because yes. I'm the same as you. I'm like, I just know. I, yeah. I can't tell you. <laughs> It's the same thing again. You have to hone and nurture that inner voice mm. to speak to you. So many people operate the other way around. Right. Uh, but you control the narrative. Like there's this, I do workshops on this. I've not done one in very long because I just don't have the time. But it's my passion to teach people about this is that um, you have that little voice that's annoying that says that you can't. Yes. You want that interview, you can't. It's too big. It's too whatever. Learning how to shut that voice up and attuned to things that you want um, is a game changer because your mind is going to listen your experience everything around you is going to build itself up on a neuroscientific level to what you want when you become it mm -hmm. it is you cannot contradict this it's it's the way it is and it has happened to my life time and again time and again and so many people would shrug it off as coincidence but yes. there are no coincidences it no. just it's it's listen there are there are people who will buy into it there are people who won't all i can say is that i think that everything that i've built is a manifestation of that principle it's nothing else of course i showed up of course there was hard work but sometimes you have to align to these practices and um know that know that there's so much power within you mm -hmm. that you expand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what sets a lot of the top leaders apart. Everyone I've interviewed here in Mumbai has this one consistent trait and it's belief in yourself. Yeah. Everyone who I've met, I'm, I'm blown away actually at how much everyone has believed in themselves from the beginning. Mm. You talk around manifestation a lot. Yeah. How do you manifest your life? Do you use vision boards? Do you use special techniques? I actually just now, um, I've arrived at the point where I don't need the gimmick. It's not a gimmick. It's, it's very necessary, the vision boarding and the visioneering and the affirmations are absolute in terms of getting you on the right path. But I have arrived at the point where I just need to sit in silence and wow. I just need to breathe and I just need to look inwards and I just need that silence and that moment where I know um, I'm going inwards. And when I go inwards, it's a whole world. Like I can see things, I'm feeling energetic, I'm feeling abundant, I'm feeling love and I'm feeling joy. And everything in your experience is a manifestation of the emotions that you are able to generate. It's a feeling universe. Um, so you're either in the positive set of emotions or you're in the negative set of emotions. And the yardstick is how you, how you kind of measure those, right? Like mm -hmm. I know when I'm feeling abundant and I love feeling that every morning when I wake up, I wake up really early. Um, and I think uh, that's my evolution.
in my mm -hmm. journey is that I don't need the vision boards. It's like in my mind. I know what my life is going to be. And what is it going to be? I think it's going to be very abundant. I think it's going to be filled with a lot more impact work that I mm -hmm. want to do. Um, it's going to be filled with a lot of amazing people in my life. Um, it's going to be a lot of good food, a lot of good travel. Yeah. Um, it's going to be just just so free flowing and effortless that it, it's just a joy to even be alive. Before we close, what's one thing you would say to any aspiring entrepreneur starting up? Begin. I always really? say this. Yeah, like I, you, you know, you you spend days and hours and weeks uh, coming up with blueprints which are necessary, but there's never a right time. You're mm -hmm. always gonna feel like, okay, maybe I can also do this and then also do that. But it's a journey. Mm -hmm. All of it is a journey, just the way life is, and you're gonna figure it out. I figured out 99% of what I do today on the job. <laughs> like I have figured it out on the job, and uh, um, I think that it's overrated to have everything planned and everything in order and all of those things like just begin and you will figure it out and life will present opportunities and you'll meet with people mm -hmm. you'll meet with um, well-wishers who will build you up yeah like have faith in that have faith in the fact that people are inherently good yes uh, I believe that too yeah I think you attract what you put out yeah so if you go out in the world and think people want to see me win people want to see me do well people want to help me yeah. That's what you're going to attract. Exactly. That's what you'll see. I think if you go out and say everyone here is so mean and yeah. people are, aren't nice to me and people are jealous of me, then that's all you're going to see. Because yeah. within everyone there's good and with everyone there's bad. Yeah. It's what are you attacking out of that person? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, exactly. I have loved speaking to you. I know we, we didn't have an, much time, but I could speak to you for hours, <laughs> honestly. We will. We will have an offline conversation and Definitely. I hope to see you when I come to London. Definitely. And uh, having my studio there as well. Yeah, I come. <laughs> <laughs> this thing for studios. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone, and thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could please press the follow, like, and subscribe button, it would really mean the world to me.